Bonjour à toutes et à tous, bienvenue dans notre cycle de conférences qui s'intitule « Éco 2 par EDF, parlons économie neutre en carbone ». Je m'appelle Frédéric Bedos, je suis journaliste, fondatrice de l'ONG d'information Le Projet Imagine et j'ai la chance d'animer ce cycle de conférences en compagnie de Thomas Olivier Léotier. Bonjour Thomas Olivier. Bonjour Frédéric. Alors je dis que j'ai de la chance parce que le moins qu'on puisse dire, c'est que vous avez un parcours particulièrement brillant, cher Thomas Olivier. Vous êtes un spécialiste des marchés de l'énergie, en particulier de l'électricité, mais aussi du management et de la gestion des risques. Vous avez fait Polytechnique, les ponts et chaussées. Vous avez ensuite étudié aux États-Unis, au fameux MIT de Cambridge, où vous avez obtenu un diplôme en génie civil ainsi qu'un doctorat en économie. Vous avez collaboré avec pas moins de deux prix Nobel d'économie, Jean Tirole et Bengt Holmström. Et au sein d'EDF, vous endossez plusieurs responsabilités. Vous êtes chef économiste et vous dirigez l'université d'entreprise pour le management. Alors, je reviens vers vous et notre invité dans un instant. Juste le temps de donner quelques consignes et explications à notre cher public. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour et merci de nous suivre et de vous être connectés au LinkedIn Live d'EDF. Cette fois encore, vous ne devriez pas être déçu car nous avons un invité de premier plan. Il s'appelle Adair Turner et comme la sonorité de son nom l'indique, il est britannique, c'est même un lord britannique. C'est la raison pour laquelle cette conférence va se tenir en anglais. Alors vous le savez, nous sommes ensemble pour environ 1h15 et la dernière partie de cette conférence est consacrée à vos interrogations. Donc afin de faciliter les choses, nous vous demandons de rédiger vos questions directement en anglais avant de nous les envoyer. Avant cela, nous aurons eu droit à un exposé d'environ 25-30 minutes de la part de notre invité et Thomas Olivier enchaînera par un moment d'échange d'environ 10-15 minutes. Voilà donc pour le sommaire. Je vais maintenant passer à la langue anglaise et c'est parti. Dear Adair Turner, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I am Frédéric Bedos and as a journalist and founder of an NGO of information, I got the privilege to host this cycle of conferences alongside with Thomas Olivier Léotier. First of all, please don't be surprised by the fact that I never take off my mask. Unfortunately, the coronavirus uh, situation is still uncertain, so we prefer being cautious. But I have good news for you guys, because you and Thomas Olivier, since you are far from each other, you are allowed mm -hmm. to take off your mask each time you speak. I'm sure it's a relief, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Adair Turner, you have such a brilliant career that I found it very difficult to summarize your background. So in advance, I must ask you to forgive me for this non-exhaustive presentation. You've been working at a high level in the economic and financial sector. For example, from 2000 to 2006, you have been vice chairman of Merrill Lynch Europe. From 2008 to 2013, you chaired the United Kingdom's Financial Services Authority. You have also held high profile roles in public policy. For instance, you've been Director General of the Confederation of British Industry from 1995 to 2000. And from 2002 to 2006, you've been Chairman of the UK Low Pay Commission and also Chairman of the Pensions Commission. In 2008, you became the first Chairman of the Climate Change Committee an independent body to advise the UK government on tackling climate change. But just before that, in 2006, you entered the House of Lords as a crossbench member. So does that mean that we have to use the, the title Lord or no. Sir when no, we no. speak to you? <laughs> no, 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 it's not necessary. No. It's not necessary, necessary. <laughs> because you speak French too. Because, you know, <laughs> since uh, the outstanding success of the series uh, such as uh, Downton Abbey ah, or The oui. Crown, <laughs> we are all fascinated <laughs> by the, the Lordship rituals and so on. But let's go back to your career. Mm. Now you chair the Energy Transitions Commission. It is a global coalition gathering major power and industrial companies, investors, environmental NGOs and experts. They all work together in order to find achievable pathways to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius by 2040, while stimulating economic development and social progress. 
So Thomas Olivier, this ambition is in perfect alignment with the constructive spirit of our cycle of conferences. Is that why you wanted to invite Adair Turner? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, 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 the purpose of this conference series is really to, um, to highlight uh, for a wider audience the, the, the tension between two different views on decarbonization. I mean, there's no there's a complete agreement on the fact that we need to decarbonize our economies. The faster the better, 2050 would be great. Uh, but there are different views on how to get there. There's, there's, there's one view, uh, one extreme view that is about technology, that says technology is going to do the trick uh, and we don't have to worry about anything and we'll just invent new machines that, that work without carbon. And, and then there's another view that says, no, it's all about reducing the size of our economy, reducing our consumption, and it's really about degrowth. And those are the two extreme positions, and, and, and of course, the answer has to be somehow of a middle ground, and, and it cannot be at the extreme. And, and the purpose of this conference series is really to listen to different experts, and, and they tell us uh, you know, where they think the middle ground is, and why and why not. And, and, and Lord Turner uh, actually produced a, a very wide body of knowledge, and it was encapsulated in a paper he published in November 2020 that really focused on uh, and the title of the paper is actually very clear. It's about techno-optimism, behavior change, planetary boundaries, and it, it's really the perfect uh, paper for this conference series because it tells us where he thinks the middle ground is going to be, and more importantly, he argues why using numbers and data. So that, that's why we're so excited to have him here with us. I think that now we are all very impatient to hear you. So, dear Adair Turner, the floor is yours. Merci, Frédéric, et bonjour à tous. I, I will speak, however, in English for the rest of my speech. I'm sorry for that. I, I apologize. Uh, as Frederic has said, I, I chair this organization called uh, the Energy Transitions Commission. Uh, we are a global commission. We are active in China and in India and in Europe and Australia and elsewhere across the world. And we have been trying to work out how to get to a net zero economy. We believe that the climate objective should be actually be as best as possible to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade and that that requires all rich developed economies to get to net zero emissions by 2050 and all of the developing world to get there by 2060 at the latest. The question, and Thomas Olivier has posed it, is can that be done while continuing to grow the economy, <clears throat> or does it require a complete change in our standard of living uh, and our lifestyle? And there are two extreme positions out there, which I have uh, in the lecture, which uh, Thomas Olivier referred to, uh, I described as being the positions of Greta or Bill, Greta Thunberg or Bill Gates. Bill Gates believes we will find technologies uh, which solve this problem. Greta Thunberg and others believe that we have to uh, reject a high consumer standards of living, uh, live more simple lives, uh, economize on the use of, of energy dramatically. So where do I stand? Well, what I'm going to suggest is a distinction between two areas of uh, the economy and emissions. I'm going to suggest perhaps controversially to some, that in the areas of energy, building, industry and transport, in the long run, we do not face planetary boundaries. We can have limitless amounts of, of clean energy and therefore continue uh, to have high material standards of living. But I am still very worried about uh, our progress in dealing with climate change. I still think we face the danger of catastrophe. And that is partly because it will just take us too much time to build that system that we could in energy building, industry and transport. But also because there is one area where we have, we are less confident that we have the technological solutions. And that is everything to do with food and fiber, agriculture, and land use. In physical terms, you could say that I'm an optimist in everything to do with how we turn photons arriving uh, from the sun and turn them into electrons to drive our motors or heat our homes, but in everything to do with the processes by which we photosynthesize complex uh, hydrocarbon molecules which we use in our food, there I don't think we yet have the technological solutions, though we may be able to develop them.
Let me begin with the optimistic news. At the Energy Transition Commission, we are very convinced that in everything to do with energy building, industry and transport, we can get to net zero and that we know the technologies that are going to get there. And at the absolute core of it, it's not the entire bit of the answer, but it's sort of 70, 80 percent of the answer is decarbonize electricity production, electrify as much as possible, and then indirectly electrify part of the economy by the production of green hydrogen. We are very confident that it is now possible to decarbonize electricity systems at costs far lower than we used to think was possible 10 years ago. When I was the first chair of the UK's Climate Change Committee in 2008, we produced estimates of what would happen to the cost of producing electricity from solar photovoltaics and wind, uh, and also estimates of batteries. And I have to say, I hope that people have destroyed our original reports because they are so embarrassingly wrong. We failed to see the dramatic reduction which has occurred over the last 10 years. The cost of producing electricity from solar photovoltaics has fallen about 85% in just 10 years. The cost of producing wind power is down 60 or 70%. The cost of producing batteries is down 85%. Indeed, solar, you can think of it like this. It's even more dramatic. When Germany first started trying to stimulate the growth growth of solar photovoltaics by, as it were, paying Bavarian farmers to put uh, a solar PV uh, on their cow sheds in 2000, uh, they were paying them a feed-in tariff of 40 cents per kilowatt hour to make that economic. A few months ago in Saudi, there was a major auction for the delivery of massive amounts of a, elect uh, a solar electricity, which was at one point 0.05 cents per kilowatt hour. That is a reduction of about 98% uh, rather than just 90%. Because of this collapsing cost of solar, wind, batteries, and also uh, green hydrogen, and I will come back to this story, we now believe, and this is, I didn't believe this 10 years ago, but I do believe it now, that one can set out to build systems which are as much as 70 or 80 percent, electricity systems, 70 or 80 percent, dependent on variable renewables, solar and wind, and that you can do that at costs which once we've built those systems will be below the cost of uh, fossil fuel systems which most countries have across most of the world. Now we certainly do not exclude a role for nuclear and I suggest here at EDF, I suspect here at EDF there may be some questions on nuclear uh, later. Uh, we certainly think it is crazy to phase out existing nuclear plants before end of useful life and it may be that new nuclear has a role to play. But over the last 10 years, what is the cost reduction that we've seen is a dramatic rush reduction in the cost of renewables and therefore any balance between renewables and nuclear uh, on average across the world must have shifted dramatically in the renewables direction. Of course, the fundamental question with a power system dependent on renewables is what do you do when the sun doesn't shine uh, overnight and when the wind doesn't blow in, for instance, a, uh, an anticyclone in the North Sea, which is where the UK will get most of its uh, electricity from. But we believe there are answers to that, that the diurnal balance day to night can be balanced uh, with batteries which are getting relentlessly cheaper and that the seasonal balance problems uh, can be balanced in a number of ways including the use of hydrogen uh, created from uh, electricity when it is surplus in supply, for instance in the summer months, and then actually burnt in gas turbines to produce electricity when needed uh, when the renewables are short. We are very confident of this conclusion and we have looked at it in China and India and Europe, a fundamental conclusion that we know how to build zero carbon electricity systems with renewables, maybe with nuclear as well, but if not nuclear, we can do it with renewables and at costs below that of fossil fuel systems. And with that green electricity, we should electrify as much of the economy as possible. One of the fundamental things to realize about electrification is it is in itself the most powerful driver of energy efficiency improvement. 
Internal combustion engines are an incredibly inefficient engine attached to an incredibly dense uh, and uh, therefore uh, economic a energy storage uh, system. A, a liter of a, a gasoline or diesel uh, packs a hell of a lot of energy into it, but we then put it into an internal combustion engine which inevitably wastes about 75% of that energy in heat, not in the kinetic power, the kinetic energy that you want to drive the car forward. When you switch to an electric engine, you are getting about 95% of the energy in the battery is going into actually what you want to do to drive the auto forwards uh, rather than uh, into wasted heat. And it is that fact that means that once we have good enough batteries and we now have them, Electrification of road transport is going to occur, I think, far faster than people realize. Within five years, it will be cheaper to buy electric cars up front as well as far cheaper to buy them. Uh, at least in the passenger car side, uh, the internal combustion engine is dead. We just haven't buried it yet, but we will get round to burying it soon. And almost all auto manufacturers across the world are now committed to be entirely electric in their sales by 2035 but I think it may occur even earlier. Similarly, in heating, in heating people's homes, uh, when we use electricity, we have this wonderful potential to use a heat pump, which can produce a kilowatt hour of heat, uh, four kilowatt hours of heat inside the home for only one kilowatt hour of electricity put in because it is sucking a heat out of the ambient air outside the house. And that is an efficiency rate of 300 or 400 percent, which will always beat a gas boiler, which however efficient you do it, you will never take above uh, 90 percent. So electrification is the route to a zero carbon economy. It also has huge local environmental benefits. This is the great technology. We've had it for 130 years, but we are now going to expand its use dramatically with huge benefits for the quality of our local air quality, etc. And we at the Energy Transition Commission see a world in which the use of electricity will go from about 20% of final energy demand. But on average, when you use en energy, you're getting about 20% you're actually using in the form of electricity, 80% you're using directly in fossil fuels. We believe that that 20% will go to 60% or, or still more. We believe that even in rich developed economies like the UK, we will double the use of electricity or more by 2050. In France, it's probably a bit less than doubling, simply because you are more electrified already. Very similar populations, the UK and France, you consume about 500 terawatt hours of electricity, uh, something like seven to 8,000 uh, kilowatt hours per person per year. Uh, in the UK, we consume uh, about 300 uh, uh, terawatt hours, uh, about uh, 5,000 kilowatt hours per person. So less of an increase in France, but in all rich developed countries, a big increase. And in India, a six times increase. In Africa, a 15 to 20 times increase. We can see a world in which the total demand for electricity in its direct use goes from 27,000 terawatt hours to something like 70 to 90,000 terawatt hours by 2050. And I think this is a hugely exciting new industrial revolution. But of course, there are some sectors of the economy that you can't directly electrify. There's no direct way to electrify uh, the production of cement because there is a chemical process occurring there which is, produces uh, CO2. And indeed, in heavy industrial sectors like steel, cement, chemicals, long distance like shipping, aviation and trucking, long distance trucking as against shorter distance delivery trucks, uh, it is either difficult or prohibitively expensive uh, to directly electrify. But in a report which the ETC produced three years ago called Mission Possible, we described that even in these hard sectors of the economy, though we want to stop calling them hard, it's absolutely possible to get to net zero by 2050. There are a whole variety of technologies that we will use to get there, but one of the most important is hydrogen. We believe that in steel production, 
which primarily across the world at the moment is based on the use of coking coal as both the energy source and what is called the reduction agent, the thing which, as it were, sucks the oxygen molecules uh, off uh, the iron molecule uh, in the reduction process. We will be, that is currently done with coking coal. That will be very significantly replaced with hydrogen. We see a world in which demand for coking coal will fall by something like 85 or 90 percent within the next 30 years, and hydrogen direct reduction of steel will play a major role. Uh, I was last week, unfortunately, I don't have it now because I lent it to somebody else. I have now a 500 gram tablet of steel produced from hydrogen direct reduction by the Swedish company SSAB. This is not a future technology. It's with us already. Similarly, in shipping, the major container shipping companies like uh, Maersk are now committed to zero carbon shipping by 2050. And one of the crucial technologies there is burning ammonia in ship engines and you make ammonia from hydrogen. And the good news is that the cost of producing green hydrogen is also collapsing. There are only thing, two things that matter to the cost of producing zero carbon hydrogen. One is the cost of the energy that you put in, the electricity uh, that you put in, uh, and the other is the cost of the electrolyzers. Just for those of you who don't know how you make green hydrogen from electrolysis, you probably did it as a kid. If I had here a battery and two wires, and I put the wires into this water here, bubbles would come off, oxygen from one and hydrogen from another. It's an electrolysis uh, process. That process at the moment costs about $5 to produce a kilogram of hydrogen. We are absolutely confident uh, that within the 2020s, you will see that price falling below two. In some of the most favorable places, below $1.5 per kilogram. I, in Glasgow last week, I was uh, with the Chilean Minister of Energy, who says they have a clear target of hydrogen from Chile at $1.50 a kilogram uh, by 2030. Uh, uh, and in India, uh, the major businessman, Mukesh Ambani, is aiming for $1 a kilogram. And that reflects the fact that the cost of electrolyzers are now collapsing in the same way that the cost of solar PV collapsed. Overall, therefore, we see a role for hydrogen dramatically reducing in the economy. At the moment, the global economy consumes about 100 million tons of hydrogen. We would see the direct use of that going to 500 to 600 million tons by 2050, with the majority of that, the vast majority, 85% by then, made in this green electrolysis route, rather than, as today, from steam methane uh, reforming. We also, in addition to the direct use of hydrogen in the chemical sector, in long-distance trucking, in long distance rail, where you aren't, if you don't have electrified tracks, in a steel, in uh, aviation, uh, and in uh, a, uh, a shipping. In addition to that direct use, we also, as I mentioned earlier, believe that hydrogen will play a major role as a seasonal balancing storage mechanism uh, in the power uh, sector. And that, of course, will increase even more our demand for electricity. If we produce 500 million tons of green hydrogen from electrolysis, and if that takes 45 kilowatt hours of electricity input for ki per kilogram, it's about 50 today. Um, at the limit, it might come down to 42 uh, by uh, 2050, but let's take 45 as a reasonable measure. That would mean another 22,500 terawatt hours of electricity on top of the 70 to 90,000 used uh, directly as electricity. In addition, we may use significant amounts of electricity to power direct air capture of carbon to do what is called direct air capture and carbon capture and storage in order to achieve some negative emissions that we may need to get to absolute zero. The key point, therefore, is that there are lots of things that we need to do to get to a zero carbon economy. There is a role for CCS. There is a role uh, for bioenergy, though we have to be very careful that the use of bioenergy is not competing with food production and biodiversity. So there are a variety of technologies, but you can think about 80% of our challenge being build a huge electricity, green electricity system 
and a very large green hydrogen production system. Those aren't just one among a list of technologies, they are the absolute building blocks of a future economy. Can it be done? Could it be done without nuclear? Um, well, people have dreamed for a long time that uh, we will have in the future a limitless source of energy called fusion power. And I certainly don't exclude the possibility that within the next 20 years we may develop nuclear fusion power here on Earth. But the great news is that even if we don't do it, good fortune has placed 93 million miles away the most massive nuclear fusion plant you could possibly imagine, which is called the Sun. And that shines down on Earth each day 8,000 times more energy than entire human energy needs which means that we only have to capture one eight thousandths of it and we can have a completely green electricity system. And if you work out how much land is required, if you were crazy enough, it would be a silly thing to do, but if you tried to do the whole of our electricity system, that 100,000 plus terawatt hours electricity system in the future, if you did all of that in solar with no wind, no nuclear, no nothing, you would only need to dedicate about one to one and a half percent of the land area of the world to solar PV panels to provide that electricity. As for things like mineral resources, people sometimes say, oh, but this new system, these batteries, it's going to require lithium and cobalt and nickel, and look at the destruction done by mining. But I would ask you to just consider this fact. If we had two billion automobiles on the road in 2050, two billion for a pop global population of uh, eight or nine, and if every single one of them had a battery of a 60 uh, kilowatt hour battery, Given the small amounts of lithium required in a battery, it's absolutely crucial, but the actual amount of lithium is quite small, we would need to have a stock of about 19 million tons of lithium in those batteries. Eventually, we will be able to recycle that batteries and those batteries in a continual process, but as we build it up, we might have a period where we are having to mine about 1 million tons of pure lithium per annum which is about 7 million tons of lithium carbonate, which is actually the material you typically start with. So mining 7 million tons of lithium carbonate will undoubtedly have an environmental impact somewhere in the world. But ask yourself this, what do you think is the environmental impact of mining 7 million tons of lithium carbonate rather than mining 7,000 million tons of coal, which is what we do today? This, we, 8 billion, 9 billion people cannot live on the earth without some adverse environmental impacts. But the environmental impacts of this new green electricity system that we are building are trivial compared with the environmental impacts which have been imposed by our fossil fuel system, not only in terms of their impact on the global climate, but also in their local environmental effect. So overall, that point of view makes me confident that we have a way to make all of the energy building and industry and transport systems of our economy by mid-century zero carbon and at costs to the economy so trivial we will hardly notice them. Indeed, with induced technological change, this could be a, a positive effect. But despite that, I still attach only a 30% probability maybe, maybe it's up to 40% after Glasgow, to us preventing the temperature going to potentially catastrophic levels. Why is that? It's for two reasons. One, it's because although we are absolutely certain that we can build this green economic electricity and energy system of the future, it will simply take us time and we have left it too late. And the challenge is the speed at which we get there rather than the technological possibility of getting there. And that is where we do have to accept some costs to go faster than the technologies will naturally uh, deploy. That is why we need strong policies to push it in that direction. The other thing that makes me worrying, ha worried, however, is that there is another sector of the economy where we do not yet have the technological answers that we have in energy building, industry and transport. And that is in particular in our food production systems. Human beings currently consume about 450 exajoules of non-food energy a year, about 125,000 terawatt hours. If 8 billion people on Earth 
each had an adequate calorific intake of 2,200 calories. That would be equivalent to about 7,400 terawatt hours of energy input. So all of our food input is only about 6% of our non-food energy consumption. But the challenge is that whereas in the buildings and industry and transport we can stop using the carbon molecule and instead use electrons, uh, we don't know how to do that in our intake of food. And the fundamental problem we have is that the processes of producing food are inherently massively inefficient. When you have a field of solar PV panels, at current levels of efficiency, they are turning about 15% of the energy arriving in photons from the sun, 15% is ending up in electrical energy in the electrons moving through the wires. When you do photosynthesis of vegetable matter, the energy efficiency rate is about 0.5% even for some of the most efficient photosynthesizers in the world, such as sugarcane in tropical arenas. So we have a fundamentally less efficient way of turning solar energy uh, into the energy we consume, the chemical energy, because it goes through that inefficient photosynthetic process. But if we consume our protein in meat form, we then take that vegetable matter and we put it through another very inefficient a, a processor called cattle or sheep, which have a conversion efficiency of about 4%. So you've got a total system uh, with a, a, a conversion efficiency of 0.5% uh, multiplied by 4%. And that is why the consumption of our food has a massive environmental impact. It is why it is the most fundamental driver of the deforestation uh, of the tropical rainforest. And it is also true that these, uh, uh, these uh, food processors uh, called sheep and cattle uh, produce methane, which is also a hugely powerful greenhouse gas. About a quarter of our greenhouse gas problem derives essentially from the food and agricultural system, not from the building and heating and industry and transport and motion system. And so in that area, that is where we are further away uh, from technological solutions. I believe, however, that we are likely in the next 20 years to achieve those technological solutions. I think that synthetic meat uh, is going to be a hugely powerful technology. And the way the people who are developing synthetic meat put it, compared with the people who produce beef cattle uh, from cows is, every year we're getting 10% more efficient, and every year your cows are as efficient as the year before. And when you have mathematics like that, eventually you win. So where do I end up standing on Greta versus Bill? In the long term, I'm an optimist that we know how to have a zero carbon electricity and energy system which can meet our needs. And in the long term, I'm also confident that we will find technological solutions to the still problematic one, which is food, where the technologies are at an earlier stage of development. But I am worried about the pace at which we can do, which is why today I've given up eating uh, red meat. I try as much as possible not to fly. I wear woolly jumpers and I turn down the thermostat and I try to reduce my carbon impact by shifts in lifestyle because I think as the current generation, we need to make those shifts in lifestyle to speed the emissions reductions. Confident, however, that by the time we get to the end of the 21st century, those changes in lifestyle will probably be unnecessary because in the long run, we do have the technological fixes available. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, uh, dear Adair Turner. It was a really interesting lecture and you talk about two sides of the same medal in a way and two, time, two timings to deal with. So Thomas Olivier Léotier, can you share with us your first reactions? Um, well, of course, it's enthusiasm, right? I mean, optimism is, and techno-optimism is something we at EDF, uh, we love to hear, and that's something that very much we share. Um, the, the, the notion that uh, uh, technology can help solve the problem, but it's not the only solution, but it's certainly a big driver of uh, resolving climate change is, is something that we, we care passionately about at EDF or, or, or statement of purpose or corporate statement of purpose. It's about 
reconciling well-being and decarbonation and, and, and innovation and technological innovation is at the core of that. So that's something that we, we strongly agree with. Uh, a lot of the issues that, that Lord Turner mentioned, we, uh, we are involved in. Uh, of course, uh, we are involved in, 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 in uh, uh, helping uh, making uh, carbon-free electricity. Uh, one, uh, most of our, a significant share of our capital investment goes into carbon-free electricity. Uh, we put a significant amount of money in renewables. We believe, uh, and that's probably a point of difference with what uh, Lord Turner explained, and I'm sure a lot of questions will come on that, so I won't expand on that. We believe that new nuclear is essential. And the reason why we believe so is that we think given the time schedule and the time constraint, if you want to get to net zero by 2050, uh, we think that it's hard to do it with it new, new, without new nuclear because the other technologies may not be available by the time we need it. So that's why we think that new nuclear is essential uh, to get there fast enough. Uh, but I guess there will be other questions, so I won't expand on that. Uh, on the other topics, which is increasing the use of electricity, we do that a lot. We help our client, uh, Dalkia, which is our energy services subsidiary, does a lot of work with their clients to reduce their energy usage. Uh, the, com the commercial activity, uh, they, we are helping our customers uh, install the heat pumps because we agree that heat pumps are very important and reduce the energy usage. Uh, we've done a lot of R&D and we have some uh, uh, some apps for residential customers called Equilibre uh, to help them reduce their domestic usage. So we try to participate and accelerate as much as we can on energy efficiency also. Uh, we help on the electrification of cars uh, by installing uh, uh, charging points. We have a subsidiary called Easyvia, which installs charging points. Uh, we do, of course, a bit of hydrogen because we agree that hydrogen is important and we have a couple of startups there that are involved in hydrogen. So by and large, we completely share that view that, that, that electricity is key to the energy transition uh, and that making green power and using green power is key to making that happen. Uh, we share your concern that had we started 30 years ago, it would have been much easier than starting today, but uh, that, that's what it is. And I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, a, a bit later. The, the final point I want to, uh, two, two points, two reactions. Uh, the, the one that you made is about the climate uh, about the behavior change. Uh, there's something, in, there's a word for it in French, it's called sobriété. Uh, sobriété, well, yeah, I mean, it, it sort of means uh, making uh, small changes to my behavior uh, that, that will lead me to, to reduce my consumption. And, and it's very important to differentiate sobriety from degrowth. Yeah. Sobriety is I consume a bit less, and maybe the economy grows a bit less because I consume a bit less, degrowth is actually the economy shrinks. And, and that's that, that balance we try to strike and we do some work on that, uh, which I think matters. Uh, the, the, the final point, and, and, and uh, where we have a concern, which is slightly uh, something you didn't completely talked about, is uh, when we look at the cost of energy transition, uh, I read in the in the fantastic reports that you put out, and if somebody wants, I think those are the, both the conference you gave and the ETC reports are remarkably well done and very clear. No, that's remarkable. We spent a lot of time working on them. Uh, the the cost of the energy transition in terms of investment, capital investment, yep. uh, I think you're very optimistic. And 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 when you compare it to the other uh, agencies, for example, the uh, international energy agencies put at two to four percent of GDP. Uh, uh, in the last report from the International Energy Agency, they, 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 fight, they, they size the gap to the investment at about 5% of GDP. So it's a significant mm -hmm. amount of GDP. And, and, and we think it, it's, it's not completely straightforward to do. Because, I mean, you, you are the chairman of the Financial Regulation Authority in, in the United Kingdom. You, you understand that 5% is a significant amount of money to, to finance. And, and somehow it has to impact uh, the, 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 the finances of, of individual it may lead to a raise of taxes. It may reduce the rate of return that investors get. So there's something that we feel is tricky. And the other point, uh, which we also think and is tricky, uh, which dampens a bit the optimism, is, uh, is the political narrative. Uh, we, as, you know, we, as a company, we have a lot of interactions with a lot of people in the fields and so on and so forth. And, and we find the, the political narrative very hard to fathom, and that's that's 
make us less optimistic maybe than you are. Because actually what happens when you look at the economy over the last 20 years, for better or worse, the, the bottom 10 of 25 percent of the income distribution feel that globalization, automatization has made them worse off. So they feel worse off than they were in the 80s. And, and some numbers actually justify that and, and that, that people are really worse off, or at least not as well off as the top 1%. So we're going to have to come to people and say, look, uh, we are not really able to solve your problem today. You, you're, you, know, you, you feel that your economic situation has not improved. You feel that your prospects and your children's prospects have not improved. But we're going to ask you to invest 5% of GDP or maybe 4 into something that will not benefit you, but that will benefit your children because that's very important. And we find that a very difficult political narrative to, to, to make. And, and truth be said, truth be told, nobody, no politician in any country has tried to told, tell that story. So we agree with you about techno-optimism. Techno we, we feel confident, but we feel the financial costs and the political obstacles are, are kind of standing in the way of technology in that case. And I was wondering what you make of that. Well, well, let's start with the costs. I, I would have to go back to the IEA figures, but when we've looked at the IEA figures, we, we don't think we're dramatically apart. Um, order of magnitude, we think that this requires maybe 2% of GDP in additional investment in all the new things that we need to do. Um, and about, but that is offset by about 0.5% of global, global GDP not spent on fossil fuel investment because there is an offset there. So you end up with a, a, a net of about 1.5%. In calculating that, there are some things which you can get your brain around quickly and some uh, are, are, are tricky to do. And there's an issue of what you're counting. If you're saying, okay, what does it take to build these wind farms or these nuclear plants or these solar PV and the transmission lines, you can do it in an engineering uh, bottom-up basis and you can see what your assumptions are and you can check them fairly clearly. You then get in these figures some choices, some conceptual choices. Some people put in the purchase of buying new electric automobiles, but you know, if you hadn't bought a new electric automobile, you'd have bought a gasoline or diesel automobile. So that's not an additional thing, but you have to be wary of the figures there. And there's one which is really difficult to work out, which is buildings. So when you have a new, you know, build a new uh, uh, zero carbon system, you not only put in a heat pumps, but you may insulate the building better. You may build the building in a better fashion. And working out what is incremental to what you would have done in any case, that becomes an sure. art, not an engineering science. So as it were, the what is it going to cost to build my wind turbines is a piece of engineering science. Yes. And then some of these uncertainties come from these conceptual issues of what you're counting and the difficulties of measurement when you get to building an automobiles. So we will look at it again, but uh, we, would, we would use a figure of maybe you know, one and a half percent net. And the UK Climate Change Committee, if you look at its what's called its sixth carbon budget report produced last December, which was really detailed analysis for the UK, uh, ends up with a figure of about one and a half percent investment. And what it shows is that the profile of the economic burden of this, uh, is it an economic burden, you have to think of in this way. We need by the 2030s to have increased investment by about one and a half percent of GDP in order that by 2050, GDP will be no lower, but possibly higher, uh, and the operating cost of running the system uh, will, be, will be lower. So by 2050, our standard of living will be no lower and potentially higher, but there is an investment phase. Now, in economics, there are some cases where it's very um, dangerous to try and draw analogies between the macro economy and the micro in everything to do with monetary and macroeconomics. That's a very dangerous thing to do. But in this area, you can think it through in household terms and get the essence of it. Um, if a household has to insulate its house better and buy a heat pump, that in the UK is going to cost maybe 10 to 15,000 pounds, so you know, 12 to 18,000 euros per household. Once they've done it, they will have lower uh, energy bills than they do at the moment, but that's an investment. And in a sense, it is that which we have to do uh, across the whole of the economy. 
It's also worth working out where are the big numbers. And again, I would point you to, at least for rich developed economies, and at least one starting from uh, the UK, the investments are completely dominated by two things. One is building the new electricity system, which is not just decarbonizing, it's just building a much bigger electricity system, a UK electricity system capable of generating and transmitting 600 terawatt hours, not 300 terawatt hours. That is one big item, and it's about, say, three quarters of a percent of GDP, which for 20 or 30 years has to be devoted to building that new system. And the other is the residential home investment on insulation and heat pumps. Everything else, interestingly, is quite trivial. You may think, oh, there's a huge burden to invest in, you know, all the new steel mills that we need. Well, we've just new produced a new report uh, endorsed by pretty much the whole of the European steel industry, by ArcelorMittal, and ThyssenKrupp, and SSAB, and the major Russian company, Severstal. And it shows that the zero carbon steel com uh, system of the future will cost about $6 billion extra per annum to build compared with the $30 billion or so which the global steel industry invests today. So that's an increment of $6 billion per annum, whereas the increment at the global level for the electricity system is more like $1.5 trillion. And every time we look at this, we find that although it is important to unleash the financial flows for new steel mills, cement kilns, ships, aircraft, they are very small compared with this overwhelming fundamental uh, thing, which is the building of the new electricity system and what happens in the efficiency of buildings. I think you will find in almost all analyses, they end up as being 80 or 90 percent of the challenge is in those two areas. And the other investment challenges are relatively slight. Finally, in terms of the political narrative and the distribution issues, I think the way to think about it is this. There are many areas of decarbonization which the consumer will hardly notice because once you get to the consumer price level, the impact is trivial. It may be that in order to decarbonize shipping by using ammonia rather than heavy fuel oil, this will produce a significant increase spread over the next 30 years in global shipping freight rates, maybe as much as 50%. But if global shipping freight rates go up by 50%, what that does to a pair of jeans made in Bangladesh and bought in Paris will be way less than a half percent. People will just notice it. They will hardly notice it. Producing green steel may eventually be cheaper than the existing route, but initially it might be 25 percent more expensive. It might cost $500 a ton of steel, not $400 a ton of steel. But what that will do to the cost of buying a car made with steel will be way less than 1%. And across the whole of chemicals and plastics and cement and steel, there are significant costs at the business to business level. But once you get down to the consumer level, they're small. At the consumer level, at reach in rich developed economies, the distributional effects will be driven by two things. On automobiles, on average, within 10 years, people will be getting a major benefit from their household budgets. They will be buying automobiles for less than an internal combustion engine and paying less. But there will be an interesting distributional effect, which is everybody who has off-street parking and can uh, charge their automobile at home, and in particular if they're clever enough to charge it overnight on a low electricity tariff, will get a very major benefit uh, to their household budget. But people who live in apartment blocks and you need to use public chargers where there's a large premium on the price of electricity, uh, the economics don't look good for them. So that's an interesting distribution one. But by far the biggest distribution one is, at least in the UK, is the residential heat one. Uh, the impact of how much one has to spend to get houses up to make them zero carbon with heat pumps or other technologies or insulation uh, will vary according to the quality of the house to start with. 
And it will vary that some of the poorer people may have some of the worst houses. So we think that it is in residential housing above all that we need a political vision both to drive the investment but also to deal with the distributional consequences of it, which frankly means uh, using tax revenues from better off people to subsidise the transition for less off people. But I think what's interesting is, to us, the economic distributional challenges are focused on particular areas. In many areas of the economy, once it gets through to the consumer price level, it will almost be invisible to the consumer. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas Olivier and Adair. Uh, you know what? I think the audience really appreciate this fascinating conversation because we are receiving many, many questions and they are very interesting. So let's go now uh, to those questions. And I'm going to uh, begin with the um, Maybe the most obvious one uh, and the most global one. I mean, um, it's about uh, the big COP26 uh, just uh, finishing and it, it took place uh, in the UK, in Glasgow. And I think you participated to it. Yeah. So are you happy with the COP26 conclusions? Well, I have just spent two weeks in, in, in Glasgow. Uh, Glasgow in November is not normally considered a, a major tourist or even business location, but I happen to come from Glasgow, even though uh, if you knew English well enough, you would know that my accent does not give it away. So I enjoyed being back in Glasgow for two weeks. How did COP26 ended up? Look, going into COP26, we knew that the country commitments, what are called the nationally determined contributions under the Paris process, the commitments that countries made were well short of what was required to get the world on a path to a 1.5 degree pathway. Order of magnitude, in order to be firmly on that pathway, we should not only be on a target to net zero by 2050 or 60, we should cut CO2 emissions from about 40 gigatons today to 22 gigatons or so by 2030, a reduction of, say, 18 to 20 gigatons. And the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions which have been submitted, would only achieve three out of that, say, 18, relatively small. So the challenge at Glasgow was to create more momentum for the future. And there were two things that went on. One was getting a set of commitments separate from the formal NDC process, commitments of coalitions of companies and coalition of countries and companies to commit to emissions reductions and to technology improvements, which will produce uh, reductions greater than is included in the NDCs. And there were a series of those, and they will make a difference. For instance, Road transport electrification is going to go far faster than most NDCs uh, suggest. And the commitments which were made at Glasgow by most of the major automotive companies of the world to completely phase out the sale of internal combustion engines by 2035 in the passenger car and light duty vehicle area will accelerate that further. Our estimate is that probably gives us about another 1.5 gigatons, which is not in the NDCs. The coal commitments were frankly disappointing. Uh, we had quantified it. We believe that strong commitments to not only build no new coal power stations, but to begin the phase out of existing coal could potentially and should reduce emissions by 3.5 gigatons by 2030. Over we, and above the NDCs? Uh, over and above the NDCs. Um, we believe that the commitments made at Glasgow only amount to, say, 1.2 gigatons. But as you add it up across it, there are a set of commitments made separate from the Glasgow process, uh, from the, the formal negotiating process, which we could see delivering maybe, in addition to the three which is in the NDCs, maybe another eight or nine, potentially, of which, by the, by the way, the biggest is the most uncertain, which was the commitment on avoided deforestation. Um, so a, a problem there. No, sorry, it was, it, it, was nine, it was 11, including the three. So it was eight on top of the three in the NDCs. But three of that is this ending deforestation commitment. So there are a set of commitment made which will move it forward. And then at the end, in what is called the mitigation step, statement of the overall uh, Glasgow communique, there is a commitment that all countries will come back actually by the end of 2022 with new NDCs which are compatible with 1.5 degrees centigrade. So the, 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 the 
the process, the challenge in this process is to get everybody believing that the target should be 1.5, believing that it is technological possible, and committing to what is called the ratchet effect uh, in the NDCs, which tighten it further next year. So we went in with inadequate NDCs. They have been reinforced somewhat, but still far short of what's required to be on a path to 1.5. There is a ratchet process there. It's you know, glass uh, six tenths full, but four tenths empty. I, you know, it's a six out of ten score. Uh, it, but that it was never going to be better than that. We were never going to come out of Glasgow saying, "This is it. We are now firmly on a path to 1.5." But I think it established enough momentum that it drives us forward. And by the way, one of the most important things that happened at Glasgow occurred last Wednesday evening which was a press conference by John Kerry and the Chinese climate envoy, yes. Jia Shenhua. The UN, the US-China uh, declaration, joint declaration, which took everybody by surprise, was really quite a major step forward. Uh, everybody had assumed that the Chinese and the US could hardly talk to each other because of all the other ge geopolitical uh, uh, disagreements. But that had a, a, a set of very firm commitments, indeed, including commitments from the Chinese, which I think will result in the Chinese <coughs> accelerating their progress and significantly delivering on their NDCs. So, you know, I came out of Glasgow. Um, energized that we had made a step forward, uh, but still with a hell of a lot to do. That's could, for sure. If I could add something here, that, that there was something that we haven't heard about at Glasgow that we think is, uh, is necessary, and, and something actually we haven't talked about since we began, uh, which is carbon pricing. And uh, uh, we at EDF feel very strongly that uh, a carbon price signal is required uh, to accelerate and, and, and Lord Turner is right to say, you know, we, we need to go faster. And, and the carbon price signal is, is, the, is what is required to accelerate. And, and I was having, just to give you a short example, I was having a conversation with the people at Dalkia last week, and they said, you know, when our clients see the carbon price going up, they are yeah. inclined to, re, to change, you know, to yeah. change their processes, to yeah. move into yeah. electricity, because they say, wow, the carbon price is going up. We need to move away from carbon solutions. But if they feel the carbon price is going to go down again, that will slow down their, their investment decision. So we feel very strongly about carbon pricing. Of course, the revenues have to be redistributed to take care of the distribution and impact. This is the carbon dividend thing. We haven't heard from it at, at Glasgow. And, and actually, when I read the, the ATC report, which I found perfect, that, that was something that was not there. So I was wondering uh, what your thoughts well, on that are. So we're strong supporters of carbon pricing. I think the crucial thing is to realize carbon pricing is not the only instrument, sure. and in some areas of the economy, it's, it's not the most powerful instrument. Uh, if you want to persuade an ordinary individual not to install an incandescent light bulb, but to install a LED light bulb, and if you try to use a carbon price uh, which changes uh, the calculation of the net present value between two alternative investments, one investing in an incandescent light bulb with a, a lower upfront cost and a higher cost of operation, and the other an LED with higher upfront costs. Um, if you believe that the carbon price is the answer to that, you are f suffering from the economist fallacy uh, that all ordinary human beings are like economists who sit down in an evening and work out the net present value of alternative investment uh, strategies. You know, normal human beings in their households don't do that. Uh, they just don't manage uh, energy in a you know, rational, efficient fashion. And if you want people to have LEDs, uh, not incandescent light bulbs, you regulate. You have a point beyond which it's illegal to buy uh, an incandescent light bulb. On the other hand, if you are in an area where there is a lot of energy use, where energy is a lot of the cost of production, and energy is managed by a professional manager in a steel mill or a cement kiln, they spend all their time sitting down with spreadsheets and working out the net present value of alternative courses of action. And one of the most powerful things you can do is put in a carbon price which changes that behavior. So we think that in we, we don't need to be religious about this. You don't need the same carbon price across the world in all sectors. 
There are some sectors where other instruments are more powerful, but we certainly believe that a carbon price should be apply, applied in the power sector, and of course it is now under the EU ETS. Uh, I agree, for many years, of course, the carbon price was far too low, uh, and it fell too low after the financial crisis of 2008 uh, with the slowdown in the economy. And what should have happened then is a set of measures far earlier than they were introduced to underpin the price. I, I personally believe that the EU ETS and other carbon pricing systems should have a fluctuating price but a clear minimum sure. uh, uh, within it to send that signal, that certainty to business that they know the carbon price is not going to go below uh, a, a given level. But in the heavy industries in particular, carbon pricing is very important. It would also be very, very powerful in, 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 in shipping and aviation. But there, those are also the sectors where we have the greatest problem of international coordination. Sure. Because if you apply a carbon price to the European steel industry, but not to the Russian or the Turkish, um, which is where our major steel imports come from into Europe, uh, then the people who are doing the good thing, the people who are building uh, their zero carbon uh, system are at a disadvantage. And that is why the EU is absolutely right to be proposing the, the border carbon adjustment mechanism. And I think it is working in this way. Uh, I was listening the other day, uh, I was on a conference with a set of major uh, Chinese policy makers and Mr. Benjamin Angel from the uh, uh, European Commission was presenting the case for the border carbon adjustment. And he said, let me be clear, this is a tariff which we never want to have to raise because as long as you impose the same carbon price, we won't have to impose it at their border. And there was a Chinese policymaker who did not say this is terrible, this is protectionist. They said, OK, what should be the Chinese reaction to this? And he said, what we should do in China is to extend the coverage of their nascent uh, emission trading scheme to cover the heavy industry sectors and increase the price over the time, which, of course, is exactly what we want them to do. And indeed, the leader at the head of Baowu Steel, which is the biggest steel company in the world, in China and in the world, has said recently that the EU border carbon adjustment will force the Chinese steel industry to decarbonize more rapidly. So I think the good news is the EU now does have a serious carbon price. The UK, despite our little problem of Brexit, will broadly match that carbon price. Um, I think we need underpins to make sure it goes down, but I think any reasonable person in Europe in industry is now working on an assumption of 80, 90, 100 euros per tonne by 2030, and, and that is a good expectation. And I think through the border carbon adjustment mechanism, we are now at the stage where that may begin to induce a, a, you know, other countries saying, well, we might as well in introduce a, a, a carbon price uh, in ours as well. You know, if we're going to export steel to Europe, why do we let Europeans uh, raise a, a carbon tax at the border rather than us imposing it? So I think we're beginning to head in the right direction. Again, 15 years too late. We, we made a set of mistakes in the EU ETS. We allowed far too much of this um, trading in clean development mechanisms outside uh, Europe. We set the targets too low. Uh, we allowed heavy industry to have these free allowances, which have to be phased out. They have to be phased out alongside bringing in the border carbon adjustment. But at least in Europe, I think we are now heading to serious carbon pricing. As uh, both of you, uh, well, first of all, we've got many, many questions and, and time flies okay. uh, we'll very quickly. So, yeah, we'll a little bit, right. yeah, okay. if you can do that. But I know it's fascinating. So um, as both of you, uh, you are mostly um, uh, optimistic. Um, let's see what you have to answer to this next question. According to a recent study by Accenture, only 5% of the companies listed on major European stock indexes, which have set targets to reach net zero emissions by 2050, are on track to meet their goals. What can we do to move from intention to concrete action? Well, of course, it's very difficult to know whether they're on track, because if the if the target is defined as net zero by 2050, uh, it's, it's an art form, not a science, to work out where they are now. But we're trying to make that more systematic. There's a thing called the Science-Based Targets Initiative, uh, which companies can apply to be part of, which are trying to say, sector by sector, what is an acceptable profile. 
the challenge is that if you think about you, you could get to 2050 from now to zero, you could go there in a convex curve or you could go there in a convex curve or you could go there linearly. You can't say that all companies should get there at the same pace. The shipping industry will necessarily get there in a convex curve because it will simply take time to change over all the engines in all the ships in the world to build, uh, to, uh, to use some category of zero carbon fuel. The stock turnover simply takes time. On the other hand, all the electricity systems of the rich developed world should get to net zero by 2035 at the very latest. It's absolutely possible. You are far, far closer in France than, than, than we are. Your, your challenge is to build it bigger uh, rather than to a, a, a decarbonize it. So if you are an electricity company, your acceptable, and, and if you said, I'm going to linearly reduce from now to net zero by 2050, people would say that's completely and utterly inadequate, right? You ought to be on a concave curve that gets us to zero by 2035. On the other hand, if you're a shipping company and said, I can get it down by 15% by 2030 and then, you know, 50% by 2040, but as all these new ships come in, I'll be zero, that might be acceptable. So that is the thing we have to do now. We, we are working on that within uh, the ETC on sector by sector. What are the profiles which are acceptable for that sector and which in aggregate uh, add up to it? So I think that is what we need, that discipline, uh, and we've lacked it in the past. In, in the past, people have made these statements, I'm net zero. And indeed, they're now looking at people like the ETC or the Science Based Targets Initiative. They will help us. You know, what is a good profile for a cement company, a steel company, a shipping company? Another question um, coming from uh, the Ice Makers Group. Uh, they quote you, we have good enough batteries. So I heard that there is just enough materials in the world to build just batteries for the electric cars in Europe, not in the world and not for other uses. What does it mean with we have good enough batteries, batteries which is a key product for these cars? Uh, there, there is no fundamental shortage of mineral resources for batteries. So I gave the figure earlier and in the lecture which uh, uh, Thomas Olivier referred to is the, is the detailed calculation. Um, two billion cars need about 19 million tonnes of a uh, lithium, pure lithium uh, in them. Reserves of lithium already identified are about 60, 70 uh, million tonnes across the world. Lithium is not rare. Lithium's uh, one of the uh, commonest uh, elements. Uh, it is, it's economic only to mine it in concentrated areas, but there is enough lithium uh, in the world. And uh, we know how to recycle lithium. Uh, cobalt has been a major problem uh, because it, it derives from primarily from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the production of it has very adverse environmental effects and also social effects. There's a lot of child labor, a lot of uh, informal economy. Uh, but we know how to make batteries without cobalt. Uh, we have dramatically reduced the amount of cobalt in the batteries. People in the battery business call, talk about NMC 111 or NMC 811. 111 uh, meant that uh, in the cathode, uh, there was an equal amount of nickel, manganese and cobalt, so NMC 111. We're now at NMC 811, eight times as much nickel as cobalt or, or manganese, uh, and we can make uh, uh, batteries with no cobalt whatsoever. So the answer is, when you go through the figures, um, you know, it is, completely, it is completely doable. It needs to be managed. We need very strong a, uh, requirements uh, on, on recycling, and those are being put in place in the European Union. You have to make the battery manufacturers and the auto manufacturers absolutely responsible for taking those batteries back at end of life and a, uh, uh, either reusing them, because you can take batteries which have lost a bit of uh, uh, power capacity <coughs> Uh, in a way, once a battery in a car loses 20%, it's not so useful in a car. But you can then take it out uh, and use it in, in grid storage where um, you know, you're not worried about the uh, economy of space. Um, we have to force the industry to do that. But provided you do it, um, uh, uh, this is doable. And I return to the point before. You have to compare a, this system with the existing system. 7 million tons of lithium carbonate per annum mining will have a trivial impact 
compared with a, a, a you know, 7,000 million tons of coal mining. And we, we use this word a renewable system, but we, we, we sometimes don't concentrate enough on how renewable it is. With the existing system, we take 7,000 million tons of coal out of the earth each year and we burn it. <clears throat> we take 100 million barrels a day of oil, we take huge quantities of gas, we burn them, and then the next year we have to do it all over again. With a renewable system, you take minerals out of the ground, and you put copper in electric wires, you put a, a, you know, a lithium and nickel and manganese in your batteries, and once they're there, the sun shines down, or the nuclear plant whizzes away, it produces a stream of electrons that pass through that system, and broadly speaking, at the end of the year, the system is still there. It is renewable. It's not quite the case, because batteries have a slow process of material degradation, but it is fantastically more renewable and less resource intensive and therefore less harmful to the environment than this system uh, on which we, have built, which we have built in the past. Another question uh, very expected from the audience. Some experts such as Jean-Marc Jancovici are extremely critical of any scenario that doesn't include a combination of degrowth plus a lot of nuclear generated electricity to even have a slight chance of containing at all to minus two degrees Celsius. What is your take on this view? This is really interesting for us because we, we received Jean-Marc Jancovici. I don't know if you've heard about him. Yeah. Well, I, I, I disagree. Uh, uh, and I maybe disagree a little bit with what Thomas Olivier said earlier. I don't think new nuclear is essential. I think new nuclear might be a good idea, <laughs> um, but I don't think it's essential. I think if we had to build a system which was solar and a, a, a wind uh, and battery and hydrogen based, it, it is actually doable. I mean, if you look at the latest uh, very detailed production produced by SSE, uh, Scottish and Southern Electricity, which is one of our major uh, electricity distributors and generators in the UK, absolutely detailed uh, plan of how the UK gets to zero carbon by uh, 2050 with twice as much electricity, producing 600 uh, a, a terawatt hours of electricity versus 300 terawatt hours a day. And you go through, you know, how much wind does that need in the North Sea? It needs about 90 gigawatts of uh, wind turbines in the North Sea versus 10 today. Uh, how much hydrogen capacity is the, are there the salt caverns to put the hydrogen storage? How much is electrolyzer? It is completely doable. It requires strong policies. It requires a high rate of investment. But when we run the figures, uh, we don't think that this is a, an impossible thing to do. Now, there, may, there will be challenges in particular areas. If I was making the case for nuclear, I wouldn't so much say it's essential you know, for the time scale. I would ask, how is Bangladesh going to have a, a, a zero carbon system where in Bangladesh, if you were to do it all with a solar panels, you'd have to cover about 8 to 10 percent of the country in solar panels because the population density is so much higher. And there are some countries in the world where unless we have large uh, international trade in uh, electricity or hydrogen, um, you know, we can't do it. But on the whole, uh, we can, and we believe that it is, it is absolutely doable. So I, I know that, you know, if one's arguing the case for nuclear, one likes to say it's essential. Uh, I don't personally believe that. I have become convinced. And by the way, this is completely different from 12 years ago. Uh, if you'd asked me 12 years ago, how do you decarbonize an electricity system? I would have said roughly a third, a third, a third. Renewables, carbon capture and storage on the back end of fossil fuel plants, nuclear. But since then, the estimates of the cost of nuclear have tended, if anything, to go up, though people say they can now come down. Carbon capture and storage, the costs have certainly not come down, and the cost of renewables and of the storage mechanisms have collapsed. And when the facts change, I change my mind. And I now believe in scenarios in which we can do it if we want to, almost entirely with renewables, which I, I didn't believe 12 years ago. I just want to add a point to that. I'm not going to try to convince you of the virtue of nuclear that that, that would do. Um, and I just want to take a step back and highlight why I think those conferences are so valuable because we 
uh, we have different perspectives on some issues, and clearly Lord Turner and, and, and me and a lot of folks at EDF disagree on, on whether nuclear is essential. I don't think at the end of the day it's the most important thing. The most important thing is we get to, we all agree that electricity <laughs> is required. Yeah. Uh, another point of disagreement that people who follow these conferences have seen, you know, Jean-Marc Jancovici was the first speaker, you know, has a very different view on the engineering feasibility. So he does the same math as you do, yeah. but says, look, I don't make the math add up. Yeah. And, and what we have here is another study uh, that says, no, actually, when you do the math, it yeah. adds up. And that, I thought that that's the value that the conference brings to the public, which are having experts do the math and, and come to different conclusions. It's kind of heartening and being a scientist i know that within five to ten years everybody would agree on the math you know it's just converge at some point right because yeah. the math is the math you know what uh, as time flies uh, very quickly maybe i'd like to ask you two questions um, because i think as everything is interdependent maybe you can uh, offer a global answer to those two questions let's test this huh? so the first one is the narrative that the cost of inaction is way bigger than the cost of the transition, whatever its value will be, is gaining more and more traction in the business world. Even BlackRock is saying it now. How and when do you think it will be a no-brainer in the political and public sphere? This is the first question. And the second one is salvation through technology. People still need to pay for these new equipments. How do you synchronize the pace of investments, development of technologies, and social demography changes to align system and agents in the system? So it's really big, but I think... Well, on, yeah. on the first, I mean, the cost of inaction can be seen as the cost of inaction for the whole of human society and the whole of the economy, or for an individual company. And there's a slightly different point here. Um, I think it is broadly accepted, certainly accepted by the, <coughs> the vast majority of political leadership, that the costs of inaction are huge. <coughs> Uh, and there are some, uh, you know, prodigal sons, uh, sinners repented, uh, who now accept this. I mean, uh, our, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson, until 10 years ago, used to make jokes about climate change. I saw him at a speech on Monday night saying, this will be a catastrophe for human society if we don't fix it. Um, we have absolutely got to fix it. I, I th and I so think... he didn't do that on Brexit, though. It, yeah, well, leave aside, leave aside <laughs> Brexit. Uh, they, 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 so... And I think, you know, the costs of inaction are, are staring us in the face in the, the floods in Germany, the flood, there's just been some massive floods in Vancouver, I see, uh, overnight, China, India. Even at 1.1, 1.2 degrees warming, we are seeing really, uh, you know, huge effects on the climate, and they're going to get worse and worse. When you talk to businesses, they do buy that. You know, business people are also human beings. I mean, they're parents, you know, they're grandparents. They care about the future. But there's a different thing, which is the cost of inaction in terms of just your business. And I think what's happened in the automobile industry is very interesting. The major automobile companies sat for years with inaction on a electric vehicles. They were far too slow to develop it. And along come Tesla. And suddenly they see Tesla with a market value of a trillion and their market value of even the leaders is five billion. And they're terrified that they have been Teslaed. And across the world now there are businesses which are aware that something fundamental is going on in technology, that the overall commitment to build a zero carbon economy is unleashing uh, disruptive technologies. And, you know, if you are a steel company sitting there uh, with coking coal blast furnaces, you have to make sure that you're not tesla uh, You have to drive yourself the development of hydrogen-based steel reduction rather than sitting to wait till some new startup does it to you. And I think what's happening in the, the Black Rocks and other people is businesses waking up both to a moral responsibility as citizens that the costs of inaction are far higher, but also at a sort of more narrow thing uh, that they can get blindsided by technological progress. The, the second question, look, I, th I think that's, that's a return to what we, uh, you know, we, we addressed earlier, the sequencing of investment and who, who bears it. I think the thing to start with is break it down to the issues which are difficult and are not. And although we started in the ETC by believing that steel and cement were the hard to abate sectors, because technologically it wasn't so clear what the answers are, economically 
in some sense, they're easier because, I mean, how much steel did you buy last year? Well, you probably haven't thought about this because you don't, don't buy steel. So, yeah. Indirectly, yeah. you bought, on average, about 300 kilograms of steel. That's what a rich, this consumer in rich developed society, in the car that you have made, bought, and the washing machine, or. I what, don't have a car since well, many look, years but you don't now. have it. Yes, but I said on the average. <laughs> I was turning you into the average person. So, if steel costs $500 a ton, not $400 a ton, Right? Bucks. Yeah. It's 30 bucks. It's $30. That's what buying all your steel in a zero carbon factory, you, the vast majority of people are not going to notice it. On the other hand, if you have to say to people, you have got to either change your gas boiler over to hydrogen if you think that's route, or you've got to take out that gas boiler, you've got to put in a heat pump. If you're putting in a heat pump, you've got to insulate it. That's going to cost you, you know, 12,000 euros. That's what we have to think through. So I think the way forward on this is you can get lost if you say, oh, this is immensely difficult. You know, there's huge distributional issues. It, it's different society by society. But for each society, you have to break it down and say, where are the difficult issues here? Where are going to be the significant expenditures which individual consumers are going to face? What are the distributional consequences of that? Are some going to face it more than others? Are large costs going to fall on lower income people? And what are we going to do about that? But when you break it down like that, it becomes still difficult but manageable. I think we could uh, listen to you for hours, but it's already time uh, for the conclusion. I know it's frustrating. Huh? Once again, thank you so much, uh, dear Adair Turner. It was a real privilege having, with you, having you with us today. Many thanks also to you, dear friends of the audience, of the public. Thank you for your active participation and your trust. This conference will be very quickly available on YouTube in replay, as soon as the translation and the subtitles in French are ready. You will then be able to see it again. And also, above all, uh, you will be able to share it around you. Next month, Thomas, Olivier and I, we will receive one of the <coughs> French specialists in international economics and monetary policy, Mr. Patrick Artus. We hope that many of you will be there. In the meantime, please take a very good care of yourselves. See you.